Welcome to Perfectionists Anonymous, a podcast dedicated to unraveling the myth of perfectionist living. I'm your host, Caitlin, and I'm a recovering perfectionist. I invite you to sit down, relax, and hang out with me, your supportive friend, who knows how difficult perfectionism can be and who wants to find a better way. Thank you for joining me today. Dear old world, she murmured, you are very lovely, and I am glad to be alive in you. L.M. Montgomery, Anne of Green Gables. Greetings, fellow perfectionists, and welcome to episode number one of Perfectionists Anonymous. I am your host, Caitlin, and I am a perfectionist, but I am also on a journey, a journey of learning to unlearn perfectionism as a way of life, a journey of freeing myself from the restrictive bonds that a life of perfectionism leads to. Today, I want to start out this introductory episode by defining perfectionism, sharing my story, and sharing how I knew that I wanted to make a change in my life. Perhaps you'll resonate with parts of my story, and perhaps you too are on a journey. My hope is that, through this podcast, we can learn and grow together, becoming more free to be our true, authentic selves by changing our thoughts and finding freedom. To start, let's get on the same page regarding how to define perfectionism. We'll go old school and begin with the Merriam-Webster.com definition. Perfectionism is the doctrine that the perfection of moral character constitutes a person's highest good or a disposition to regard anything short of perfection as unacceptable. In other words, perfectionists believe that if they are not trying to be perfect, then there is something wrong with them and that they are a bad person. If you are not giving your all 110% of the time to every scenario, with every person, in every place, and with every possible moral quandary, then you are wrong. You are lazy, you are weak, you are imperfect, you are not good enough. Our definitions of perfection come from a variety of places, but they are all learned. This is because perfection is entirely subjective, and every perfectionist has their own special parameters born out of their life experiences. A great deal of perfectionist ideals come from our cultures, families, religions, and ancestors, the moral values that our family units and our communities taught us as we grew. Further perfectionist ideals come from media, the movies, TV shows, books, magazines, social media feeds, celebrities, models, and advertisements that we consume. More perfectionistic ideals come from your education, the values placed on academic performance, athletic performance, artistic performance, and social status. And while all groups of people can be affected by these kinds of outside messages, there are just those of us who are particularly susceptible to this kind of messaging. Certain personality types and dispositions, certain family dynamics, certain cultural expectations, certain generations, certain identities, honestly, the list goes on and on. Ultimately, there are just sometimes existences that end up being breeding grounds for perfectionism. Certain lived experiences make certain people think that attaining perfection is the only way to live a good, right, successful, and happy life. That kind of advertising sounds great on the surface, and a lot of us fall for it. I know I certainly did. Let's break this down a little bit and see just how many areas of our lives perfectionism can take its hold. This is my story. Maybe it's yours too. Fair warning, this may be a bit overwhelming to hear all at once, but I think it's important that we talk about just how pervasive perfectionistic ideals are first. We can do it. It'll hurt, but we can confront it. Childhood. 
especially if you are socialized as female. You learn early on that being a perfect child means following all the rules, being polite, being quiet, being kind to others, not taking up too much space, and listening. Always listening. You are praised for making good choices, like sharing, using your inside voice, doing your chores, apologizing, and using kind words. You are met with one of the most cutting words in English for a perfectionist, disappointment, when you make quote-unquote bad choices, like shouting indoors, bragging about your accomplishments, or having a tantrum and letting your anger get the best of you. Being a perfect child, again, especially for those of us socialized as females, meant being small. Being meek, being less than. You must be a good girl. Elementary school. Now you learn to be the perfect student on top of being the perfect child. Being a perfect student means always listening to the teacher and doing exactly what they say getting perfect scores in math and reading, acing standardized tests that put you in the quote-unquote smart groups, following directions, raising your hand and always getting the answer correct, getting along 100% of the time with all of your peers, getting stickers on all of your work, never seeing a minus sign written on any of your work, always doing your homework on time, and never being absent. Perfect students get awards and trophies. They get recognition and attention. They learn to think that they are valuable, but only for their achievements. If you aren't perfect, you feel like no one will pay attention to you. They don't give you a nice certificate or a sticker if you just do fine. You learn to do more, always. Before we continue, I feel that it's important to mention that I am fully aware that those are all nice things to say about a child. I personally got my fair share of compliments and encouragement as a child, and I fully recognize that that puts me in a place of incredible privilege, because that is not something that every child gets in life. I grew up with two parents and a family that loved me. I grew up in a way where I was encouraged by my teachers and coaches and other adults. I was, by all accounts, incredibly lucky, and I do not in any way discount that. I need that to be clear. And... At the same time that I was incredibly lucky, all children take in messages and experience love in complicated, intricate ways. At the same time that I felt loved, I also felt that that love was entirely contingent upon my success and my goodness, and that if I ever screwed up, then all of that love, all of that encouragement, all of that support would be gone in an instant. I'm not saying that it objectively was that way but I am saying that it absolutely felt that way. Because at the same time that everyone was praising all of the things that I did or was, not a single person ever praised me for simply being me. No one told me that it was okay if I made a mistake. Instead, I got in trouble or was told that I should fix it. No one told me that I would be worthy if I wasn't perfect. No one paid attention to me if I was simply ordinary or normal or good enough but they sure did tell me if i was too loud too bossy too annoying too whiny too ungrateful too selfish too human so perfectionism became the coping mechanism let's continue secondary school the pressures of being a perfect student intensify because now you also better be thinking about your future. To be a perfect high school student, you must have perfect grades and not just perfect, the best. You must be valedictorian and get a perfect score on every test and every assignment. And if there was extra credit, then you needed to be more than perfect. You still need to have perfect attendance, never mind if you are tired or sick or struggling with your mental health. You need to push through and stop complaining. Perfect students get it done, no matter the cost. Extracurriculars. And remember, a perfect student isn't just perfect for their grades. Oh, no. You must also be thinking about sports and the arts. After all, in addition to your grades, these accomplishments are perfect scholarship fodder. And a perfect student always gets lots of scholarships. 
To be a perfect athlete, you must compete at the varsity level for your sports and you must be captain of your team. You must play your best at every practice, every game or meet, every tournament. You must advance to the highest level of your sport and you must do it while perfectly balancing your competitive drive and your humility. Being overly confident is not perfect. So at the same time that you must strive for the highest accomplishments, you must also not appear too eager or talk about them too much. And if anyone compliments you for your prowess, you must be gracious and kind. And to be even more perfect, you can't just do sports. You must also excel in the arts. If you participate in band or orchestra, you must be first chair, you must get solos, you must win competitions. If you are in a choral group, same deal. In theater, you must land the lead role every time, or at the very least, the most prestigious role that you can. Oh, and by the way, you should also have a part-time job. Perfect students do that too. It shows you're dependable, as if nothing else you did showed that, and it looks great on a college application. Are you feeling really crabby about yourself yet? Yeah, me too. These are the perfectionist lies that we have been taught and we aren't even halfway done yet. Let's keep going. Appearance. This is another big one if you were socialized as female. You must have the perfect body. You somehow must be tall, skinny, have a thigh gap, have no body hair, have big voluptuous breasts, and have a curvy butt and hips. You must be modest, but also embrace your sexuality. Do both at the same time. That's what perfect women do. You must never like how you look because there is always something to improve. And if you somehow manage to look perfect, you better not flaunt it. Then you are vain. Being vain isn't perfect. You must have perfectly styled and cared for hair on your head and your eyebrows must be perfectly shaped. Remember, no body hair though. Just perfect hair in very specific places. Your face must be perfectly symmetrical, with a nose that is not too big and not too small. You mustn't have a double chin. You must always wear makeup, but it better be perfect. Don't bother wearing makeup if you don't know how to avoid looking trashy or like a poser. And make sure your makeup looks natural. On your body, you must have impeccable style. Your wardrobe must be perfect. Clean, flawlessly maintained, always on trend. Your skin must also be perfect. No blemishes, no marks, no acne, no scars, no freckles, and the perfect shade. That last one is particularly horrific. Health. While you're in pursuit of your perfect appearance, you must also be in pursuit of perfect health and wellness, aka diet and exercise. Side note, the messaging we receive in this area is particularly harmful. You must exercise seven days a week, no breaks, and the good kind of exercise too, you know what I mean. You must maintain the perfect diet. Count your calories, count your macros, only eat fruits and vegetables, never snack, never have dessert, avoid sugar, avoid carbs, avoid processed foods, only eat organic, take your vitamins, drink eight glasses of eight ounce water daily, Eat like a caveman, but make sure you use a food processor. Avoid fats, do juice cleanses, do fasting, and do all of that simultaneously. The perfect woman simply must always be on a diet because if she isn't prioritizing her quote-unquote health, then she has given up on herself. Another little caveat break. Are you feeling even more crappy now? Yeah, me too. But these are the messages that we hear and then internalize as perfectionists. It feels so incredibly painful to hear them all out loud. But I think it's necessary because we need to confront how horrible all of these messages feel and then ask ourselves, do we really want to believe them? Don't worry, we're almost to the end now. Let's power through. Friendships. Of course you have to be a perfect friend to all of your friends, and you better have a lot of friends. Being the perfect friend means always being there for them and doing whatever they ask of you, even if it's inconvenient for you. Perfect friends are generous with their time and caring. Being the perfect friend means always having the best advice, always being able to emotionally support your friends, and being able to solve their problems for them. 
always. Being the perfect friend means being gregarious, funny, witty, the life of the party. Being the perfect friend means putting the needs of others before your own. You want pizza, but they want something else? Too bad. The perfect friend always bows to their friend's desires. The perfect friend gives gifts, remembers birthdays, schedules all the hangouts, and is flawlessly reliable. Oh, and remember that you're supposed to have a lot of friends? Yeah, the perfect friend is popular. They throw the best parties, they go to the best events, they are perfectly networked, they glow with confidence and know everything about everyone. But they don't pretend like they do because that would be conceited of them. Being the perfect friend means that all your peers like you, all the time. They're impressed by you, they love your company, they never have a bad thing to say about you. If people are gossiping about you and saying bad things about you, well, then it's definitely something that you did. You are clearly not being a perfect friend. You better fix that. Romance. You obviously need to have a perfect romantic partner, and you also need to be the perfect romantic partner. Your partner should make everyone jealous by how amazing they are. They should look flawless, act flawless, and be immeasurably successful. And you need to be everything for them. You need to meet all their needs, never get into arguments, support them emotionally with no screw-ups, look stunning, have a flawless system for household chores, which typically means you should be doing most of them perfectly, be perfectly compatible, love all the same things, have all the same goals, and be hopelessly in love every second of every day. If you are ever without a partner, well, that's not perfect. You must find a partner immediately. Oh, but don't be desperate. This is the last one, I promise. College and work. Okay, now be the perfect adult. Immediately. No adjustment period. You need to have a perfectly balanced budget with a thriving savings account and perfect credit at all times. You must get every single job that you apply for or get admitted into every single program that you apply for. You must perfectly balance your social life, your academics, your career, your family, and your health all at the same time. No exceptions. Your home must be perfectly clean and flawlessly designed. You must have a perfect car. You must be punctual, productive, and climb whatever ladder you're on immediately. You must be a perfect citizen and never do anything untoward. You must have a plan and you must follow it to the letter. No deviations, no plan B, no sidetracks, no breaks. Your job also better be a good one. You know what I mean. Something that pays really well, has tons of benefits, and a lot of social prestige. Doctors, lawyers, engineers, and the like. The perfect adult is the perfect student and or employee at all times, while balancing all of the other things that we've now learned also need to be perfect. Your relationships, your body, your home, etc. And that's even before or perhaps simultaneously with parenthood, which I will not be covering right now because I have not yet lived that experience. So, are you screaming yet? I'm about to. <laughs> because you know what I think the saddest part of all of this is? No human on the planet can successfully do all of those things all at the same time but every single one of them is reinforced by our society. If you try to achieve perfection in any of those areas, in any of those things, you will be praised by those around you and reinforced by the societal messages around you. And I didn't even cover all of them. I bought into this lie for a long time. I was able to achieve a lot of those things. I was valedictorian. I got amazing scholarships. I graduated summa cum laude from undergraduate and grad school. I developed orthorexia and disordered eating and exercise patterns when I was 15, and so I was skinny. I got the first job I applied for. I got choir solos, lead roles in plays, and competed at the state level three years in a row in competitive speech. I won awards, I was universally praised by my teachers and professors, and I was by all accounts successful in the eyes of pretty much everyone which I knew because everyone validated me for all of those things. But I was not happy. More often than not, I was miserable. 
What may have looked like excellence on paper felt like absolute misery between the lines. When I was 21, I was diagnosed with severe generalized anxiety disorder with panic attacks and moderate recurrent depression, a diagnosis that I now know I had way before I was 21 and likely even before puberty. I struggled my entire life to develop meaningful, long-lasting friendships. In elementary school, I learned quickly that I needed to try and be the perfect friend, but that even then, people still might not accept you. I think that's when my anxiety disorder really started, because that's when I learned that being quote-unquote perfect still was not enough. I also struggled my entire life with romantic relationships. I never had a long-term relationship in high school and feared that I never would. This fear continued all throughout college, at which time I was incredibly vulnerable and went on dates with multiple men who I was not remotely compatible with out of desperation. One of those relationships turned into a terrifying stalking situation that still haunts me to this day. All of the men that I was interested in were never interested back. Until I met my now husband during my senior year of college. The stars aligned for us, and he is a wonderful man who has helped me crawl out of my darkness. Though our relationship has not been without its challenges, at least partially because I became obsessed with trying to be the perfect romantic partner out of fear of losing the brilliance that I had. That is all to say, perfectionism has been a thread of literally every life decision I have ever made, every relationship that I hold dear, and every goal I've ever had. I've never known life without it, and while it may seem like a worthy endeavor, I have come to learn that it is decidedly not. And if you've made it this far, I suspect that you may agree with me. Perfectionism is upheld in our society as a value. Striving to be perfect isn't something that most people will criticize you for. On the contrary, they will usually validate you for it. Everyone knows on some level that it's impossible for any human to be perfect, but that doesn't mean that society wants us to stop trying. Striving for the perfect relationship means you're a good, loving person. Striving for the perfect body is honorable and healthy. Striving to never age, or at the very least to age gracefully and slowly, means that you have self-respect. Striving for the perfect house, car, career, and possessions means that you are successful and ambitious. You should strive to be perfect. But therein lies the trap. You can't be perfect. And the only reason society wants you to keep trying and thinking that if you just work hard enough, you eventually can be perfect is so that you will buy that diet pill, that gym membership, that miracle supplement, that dating guide, that expensive car, that mansion, that new phone, that self-help program, that hair color, that bougie makeup, that Balenciaga bag, that Botox, that college degree, that... Name it, and it's probably marketed in some way to target your desire for perfection. And that, at least in part, is what helped me start to see that maybe, just maybe, there could be another way. Maybe I didn't have to spend countless hours obsessing about my body and my appearance or countless dollars trying to quote-unquote improve it. Maybe I didn't need to spend countless hours worrying about mistakes I've made in the past or obsessing about which ones I'm yet to make in the future. Maybe I didn't need to lose countless hours to meal planning or workouts that I hated. Maybe just maybe I could take back my power. Maybe I could learn to silence that voice in my head that constantly told me, if you just try harder, if you just did this different, if you just fixed this, then you'll be happy. Because I have a question for you, fellow perfectionists. The lie of perfectionism is that when your life is eventually perfect, you'll be happy. But think about everything that that inner critic has made you do, feel, and think in the pursuit of perfection and ask yourself, did it lead to happiness? Odds are it did not. 
because perfectionism does not lead to happiness. It leads to fear. It doesn't lead to freedom. It leads to restriction and restraint. I have learned recently that I want something different for my short life, something better. I choose joy. I choose freedom and I choose peace. But in order to do that, I need to learn how to release my perfectionism. I need to learn how to start living without obsession. And if you found this podcast, perhaps that is the case for you as well. Our stories are unlikely to be the same because so few are, but I have a sneaking suspicion that the underlying reasons for our stories may have some similarities. Our circumstances are almost certainly different, but like me, and like every human, you have probably wanted your entire life to feel worthy, valuable, loved, safe, and accepted. And perfectionism became your way of trying to achieve that. But it hasn't worked. So if you too want to relax your perfectionism, I invite you to join me as we break things down episode by episode. One of the things I've noticed about a lot of the self-help material relating to perfectionism is that it tends to be broad and vague. You can defeat your perfectionism by just learning to not care so much or by giving yourself grace or by realizing that no one is perfect. Unfortunately, if it was that easy, then none of us would be where we are. Because I know I've heard these things before and they did nothing to change my mindset. And that's because perfectionism is powerful and binding, and it can't simply be brushed away with an Instagram quote. The lie of perfectionism needs to be dismantled step by step, uninstalled, and then replaced with a new way of life, one that doesn't compromise your values, but also lets you live a fulfilling life of peace and happiness. One that lets you be your authentic, powerful self without making you feel like you need to prove or validate yourself to anyone, let alone yourself. I started this episode with a quote from Anne of Green Gables by L. M. Montgomery. Dear old world, she murmured, you are very lovely, and I am glad to be alive in you. Life is short, life is complicated, but life in this world has the potential to be beautiful and full of surprises and is very much worth living. If you want to truly enjoy it, to live in your fullness, then it's time to release the perfectionism. It's time to be free. Thank you for listening today, fellow perfectionists. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you have been enjoying the podcast, it would mean so much if you are willing to give it a five-star rating and review. If you'd like to follow Perfectionists Anonymous, check out Perfectionists Anonymous Pod on Instagram. Until next time, fellow perfectionists. Perfectionists.